All right, kicking off. Do 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 do. Toby's here, and um, just uh, wait for everybody to join and everything. And I've got our guest today, which is Andrew. We'll do all their usual introductions and everything, and where we are uh, in a few minutes. So in the meantime, while everybody starts to join, uh, let's know where you're watching from. Uh, shout outs to all of our regulars. Uh, let us know who's watching, and of course we get your questions in now and throughout the uh, live stream itself which is always very useful it helps steer the conversation as always now we're we're here in uh, Grey Abbey Bay and yes it's the first live stream <laughs> Andrew's so great it's the first live stream that uh, it has rained actually since we've been doing these so it, that's typical to a point and um, we're going to try our best to sort of pick out a lot of the fantastic bird life that have all joined that have basically migrated down from all over the northern hemisphere and there's actually a huge flock of brent just flying across here at the moment and uh, we'll see how we go with that but like i say let us know where you're watching from and uh, get your questions in throughout and i'll pick pick the questions in as and as and when we can so i think we've got we've got almost 50 people watching already andrew so i think i think we'll kick it off so um let me just spin the camera around here a second just to do the, the all the introductions and everything Hi right, guys, so so yeah, I'm in the Mount Stewart vehicle, but I am not in Mount Stewart today. Um, today we have uh, exited Mount Stewart and headed out on some of the other areas of the East Down Property Group. And of course that is all of Strangford Lock. And we thought um, this is a perfect time this time of year. And even though the weather's really rubbish, uh, we've got all of the winter migrant birds that have arrived here on the lock. And they're kind of pretty much at their peak now. And we'll, we'll be chatting to Andrew Upton, who is here behind me at the moment. Where is he? There he is. Um, he is my manager. He's the Coast and Countryside Manager for East Down. And um, basically, birds are your thing, aren't they, Andrew? Let's spin this thing around here. I'll introduce you properly. There we go. So, so yeah, birds are your thing. Um, so your history and give us a bit of an introduction about where, you, where your sort of origins are. Okay, um, you can probably tell from my accent that I was uh, born in the West Midlands. And uh, about the age of eight, uh, I developed a real interest in ornithology or bird watching as it's more commonly known and uh, that's been really much my life since. Um, from having it as a hobby I developed it as a career and that's taken me uh, from Wales into Northern England up to Scotland working in the Shetlands and uh, further afield I've worked in Seychelles, New Zealand, Australia and about 20 years ago, I came to work in Northern Ireland on a one-year contract and have been here ever since. I met my wife and I think this is pretty much home for me. It's a similar story to myself, perhaps not quite as far as, so you're a little older than me, Andrew. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I ended up uh, not necessarily intending to stay here in Northern Ireland. Yep, met someone, you have kids, buy a house and all the rest of it as well. Um, so, so yeah, really great to be joined by Andrew. We've been trying to get out on the lock for a while, just things haven't quite aligned up um, with everything that's been going on, of course. Um, probably pick up a few updates just to, around what's happening in Mount Stewart, East Down and, and so on a little later on in the live stream. But for today, so we are here in Grey Abbey Bay. So anybody who's living in the village um, happens to be in one of those houses up there. See if you can wave and feel free to come down. You could even meet us if you want. Um, do, do let us know if you're watching from the immediate village here um, and hopefully might get some new insights to uh, to the local area that live in uh, from Andrew and his knowledge here. Um, so Grabby Bay, tell us a little bit about it Andrew. Well the, as you said earlier, uh, the Nassau Trust looks after a large area of Strangford Lock. So uh, it's about 12,000 acres that we either own or lease. Plus we also <laughs> We also hold a lot of the shooting rights as well. So there's pretty much nowhere on Strangford Lock that you can stand without seeing somewhere the Trust has some involvement with. Uh, Gravy Bay is one of our most important sites, uh, both in terms of the wintering water birds, but also the immense uh, marine archaeology interest out there as well. Today though, um, we've got probably about 5,000 light-bellied Brent geese. Uh, it's a phenomenal site. At the moment we are we've just hit low tide so the birds are quite far out but as the tide comes in those birds will be much more pushed up towards the car park and if you come down to the national trust car park 
at uh, near and high tide you will see flocks and flocks of the birds very close at hand. So, so yeah, we were just um, coming out of Mount Stewart itself and with the southeast wind today and the way the weather's coming in, actually there's a big flock of brents um, immediately either side of the main entrance and the gas works really close up. So if you're ever at Mount Stewart um, over the next few weeks, even just take a glance from the main car park and just look out over the lock, you'll see them quite close in most of the time. Yeah, this is the peak time for Brent geese on Strangford Lock. The birds usually start arriving sort of late August, early September and then they peak in early mid-October. We did the international Brent count on Friday and that involved um, a number of staff and volunteers right around the lock counting the Brent geese at a particular time and the count was about 26 and a half thousand birds of which about six percent were juveniles so those are birds which were born in Arctic Canada this year and have uh, moved to Strangford Lock. So we have up to 90% of the global population of light-bellied Brent geese from Canada at Strangford Lock in the autumn. As the autumn progresses into winter, a lot of those birds will then move elsewhere across the island of Ireland, and some birds will go as far as France and Spain, uh, lucky them. Um, but uh, the count this year was much higher than last year. We had about 21,000 birds last year, of which about 24% were juveniles. So we think the increase this year is probably a, a result of the, that really good breeding season that we had last year with those birds joining the adult population now. So that's, I mean, it's, it's great to see that this is one of the longest data sets. So speaking of a few, so anyone who had um, watched the barn owl ringing session with us and um, we were actually chatting about um, obviously Hugh's history here as well and that he's obviously been working on this is one of the longest data sets yeah. um, that exists here at Strangford Lock so it's really really valuable information you hear me talk about data 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 all the time being one of the biggest um, sort of I guess aids to informing our, our work and what we do and, and, and so on. Now, I've slowly, <laughs> you've been watching me on camera, I've slowly edged round and changed direction. So I'm trying basically to stop the rain from getting all over the, the camera and the gimbal here. So um, it's quite likely, I'm just gonna spin around it. It's quite likely that this may be cut short. So if we suddenly cut off, it's probably because my phone got far too wet and, it, and, it's, and it's cut. So we're going to see how long we can keep going here and we may take a little dash um, sort of behind the vehicle in a little minute to pick up your questions. Um, but I thought, well, while it's not too heavy, Andrew, I'll spin around here again. While it's not too heavy, perhaps we'll have a, a couple of look, a closer look at a few things on the immediate shoreline and just have a chat about some of the work that goes on with the Strangford Ranger team. So take, take it away, Andrew, you go on ahead. Shout-outs to everybody who's watching. Um, so we've got some of our regulars here. Hi, Charmaine. Uh, hi, uh, Astrid and Laura there. Hi, Leslie. Who else have we got? Hi, Aline. Oh, geez. Hi, Heather. Okay. Morning, Pauline. So yeah, do get any questions that you've got coming in, um, and we'll, we'll we'll try our best. And walking with the wind is actually not too bad here at the moment. I'm saying the rain's rain's sort of easing off a little bit. Um, but this is this is uh, probably one bit, and I know what we, Andrew's going to talk about here right now. And you'll hear me talking about invasive species all the time. Obviously, what we cover at Mount Stewart in terms of its plant species, as well as the likes of invasive animal species. Uh, it doesn't change. It's not just in the woods. It's out on the lock here as well, isn't it, Andrew? So what 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 we stood next to here? <laughs> this this stuff just here. Okay, this is a plant called. Um, Spartina, uh, more commonly known as uh, common cord grass. It was planted probably about a century ago on Strangford Lock uh, with a view to try and reclaim the mudflats for farming. Now it does a great job, it gradually dries out the mudflats, it will cover the mudflats and it means that the birds like the brent geese, the wading birds that we get here each winter are then unable to feed. So we know it's the number one threat to Strangford Lock and uh, the NASA Trust over the last sort of 10, 15 years has been undertaking a comprehensive control program on the east side. So our focus has largely been from the floodgates at Newton Ards down to Grey Abbey 
and then we've then rolled on towards Kakubbin and Horse Island and we've also done some of the islands but we know it's throughout the lock there are very few areas that don't have some Spartina and uh, there are some really big concentrations in the northwest and uh, we're the only organization out there that's doing anything about this plant so you may see sort of in late summer the ranger team out in sort of these white space suits uh, with a yellow um, backpack uh, full of sort of a chemical called fuselard and that is sprayed on the spartina and if you do that for several years it will kill the plant um, we are actually licensed by the department for agriculture uh, environment and rural affairs to spray the plant on Strangford. We have to be very careful about any spraying with a chemical in such a sensitive environment but uh, it's been extensively trialled and uh, there's no impact on the, the wider ecosystem and as I say it is extremely important that we do something to control this plant. In other sites in the UK it's basically taken off and hundreds of acres of mud flats have been lost and the wintering water bird populations have been decimated as a result so we know that doing nothing isn't an option and we have to do something. Strangford Lark is one of our most important designated sites for wintering water birds each year. We get about 80,000 birds coming to the site. It's not just the Brent geese, uh, we're internationally important for things like red shanks Bartow Godwit, Knot, etc. These birds are breeding up either in Iceland, Arctic Canada or Siberia, Scandinavia and then as the winter sets in they all start to migrate southwards and uh, they find a great location, quite relatively mild on Strangford Lock and the mud flats are full of food for them to eat. So that's probably quite a nice good point, I mean like say it kind of looks like oh maybe it's a little bit of marram grass or something establishing but yeah it, it you know it's a non-native invasive species and you can see just looking across the bay here actually behind andrew here can you see there's quite a few little spots of it coming up through here now, it grows and spreads so quickly um so yeah it's really important that we get hold of this and you can even see the impact it does have straight away so if we wanted to stabilize the 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 the, the coastline then it would be a fantastic plant to do it but obviously it does escape doesn't it Andrew? So, so you can see just I've got the world's shortest microphone cable here at the moment so bear with us everybody. Um, so, so yeah you can see actually just around it Andrew if you want to just put yourself down by the, the spot iron itself you can just about sort of see that there's like a raised level of, of sediment around it where it started to trap the sediment and of course we, the whole lock here is covered and really good sort of resource. It's the eelgrass, isn't it, that a lot of the, the, the Brent geese eat um, and so on. So, so uh, in fact, we, we sat on some dead, dead eelgrass that's uh, sort of spent around here. Do you want to pick some of that up, Andrew, just yeah. to sort of show us? Because there's just quite a few bits of it. There you go. Difficult to get anything. There's a few bits here. Okay. So, so, just looking around here on the floor, you can see what looks like kind of old seaweed, but these are all the spent bits of eelgrass that have been eaten. So Andrew's got some in his hand. Okay. okay. Yeah, as uh, Toby says, the zostera or eelgrass is what brings the Brent geese to Strangford Lock each year. It's a, it's a real superfood. So these birds are traveling from Arctic Canada. They come through Greenland, Iceland, and then arrive en masse on Strangford. And you can imagine after that long migration they're very very hungry and the eelgrass give them that sort of energy boost which will help them then get through the very hard winter that they're going to face either here or elsewhere where they they decide to winter um, but if we get spartina covering the mud flats it will start to impact on the zostera and it, it's very clear that uh, the spartina over time will re replace the zostera and then the Brent geese have got nothing to feed on. Okay, so we had a little bit of sound trouble there and I think that was because that was me not um, turning the mic around and, and <laughs> speaking into it myself. Now Andrew's been an absolute trooper here because like here's me, let me just turn the camera around again, here's, here's me with my hood and everything on with the wind to my back and obviously Andrew, <laughs> Andrew's taking the full pass of the rain here, here at the moment. Um, 
Should we take a retreat just to the back of the shelter of the car, I think? So we'll just hold on in. We'll pick up a few questions in the meantime, just while we dash into the... It's really coming down now, so this is obviously amusing. It was going to happen at some point that we would uh, get the rain on one of the live streams. But we're, we're trying our best, guys, so you can sit in your comfortable homes with a nice warm coffee or hot chocolate or something and, and watch us making fools of ourselves. So I'm just going to run back here. Oh, hey. Right. <laughs> That's a bit better. There we go. So yeah, sorry about the little sound break there, guys. Um, I'm just going to pop through a few of the questions um, we've got coming in. We've got a few bits. We've got lots of people, lots of people saying hello, Andrew. <laughs> well done for uh, for uh, Lynn. Hi, you. Good morning. And uh, we've got Liz watching. Barbara's watching for Valley Halbert. Um, lots of hellos to specifically to Andrew. Well done. <laughs> there we go. So if you guys have got any questions, now's the time to an an answer them, just while we're sort of sheltering out of the, the, the schools that are coming through here. Um, well, I suppose a good chance just to pick up on a few updates for Mount Stewart while we're here. I'm just going to swing my camera around here a minute. There we go. There we go. See if we can get a bit of shelter. And I think that, there we go, the rain has just passed. Anyway, so at least we can stand up. Um, so hopefully sounds okay now, just... Uh, uh, the screen is absolutely plastered and I hope we don't cut off. Um, so a few updates from Mount Stewart. Um, Grey Control is doing pretty well. We've, we're, we're slowly getting hold of them. I mean, off the back of the last live stream, we were facing all but one of the um, sites that we cover across the peninsula um, had Grey Squirrel activity on it. Um, that one that didn't, a few days after, had Grey activity. So we're slowly getting through them, which is good. Um, and the red squirrels are also doing really well, seeing lots of activity and foraging, which is really good as well. And the Pine Mountains have been having a whale of a time at Mount Stewart. Um, so we've been getting some really good footage. So hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll put together a little uh, wildlife video for you. Um, well, so, uh, we haven't made it through the full process of the consultation and outcomes yet. So we don't know 100% what's happening there with, with everybody. Um, but we do know that we are one of 10 properties that is going to be retaining its learning, outreach and education um, elements. And we don't know what it's going to look like yet, but it's fantastic that we're going to be able to obviously retain that, that element. And it's a, and a testament to basically it's kind of what we've been doing here at Mount Stewart and East Down uh, for quite a while now when it comes to learning and outreach. So that's really good. Um, so pick up a few questions here, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna, the rain has just started again. <laughs> So I'm going I'm to dip, dip down behind here. Do you want to squat down there? At least we've got the lock in the back of the... <laughs> this is hilarious. Right, so uh, there we go. So we've got... Um, Leslie's asking, um, do we know what the oldest Brent goose that's been um, sort of seen or, or ring returns on the lock at all? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, these birds are relatively long-lived, so they can quite easily live to sort of 25, 30 years old, but uh, I don't know. We have in... Um, the last decade, been fit, well not National Trust, but uh, we've been working with uh, a number of universities, um, fitting the birds with uh, big plastic Darvik rings, and those can be read relatively easily with a pair of binoculars or telescope. So that's given us a much uh, more detailed uh, understanding of the birds' movements, and over time that will give us more information in terms of how long these birds live and uh, we may be able to update you at a later stage on that. So, I'm having to do question. Oh, there we go, there's the mic. I'm having to do questions and uh, hold the mic and all the rest of it with the screen. So anyway, bear with me a minute. Um, yes, because I um, actually did someone uh, text me a, a picture of a, I think it was a, a cormorant or, a, yeah, it was a cormorant in the end, I think it was, or possibly a shag, I always get too mixed up. Um, with the ring return on it and that ri that bird I think it was ringed on the Copelands Islands uh, and it was I think it was 12 years old at the time so yeah, it's surprising how long a lot of the, the the marine birds actually live for and then of course things like the sandwich terns and and um, common terns and things like that they they can be in excess of 50 years um yeah uh, probably the the oldest living bird that we have in Northern Ireland is the Manx Shearwater and uh, if I remember one of those lived to sort of 50, 60 years old. So these birds are undertaking exceptional journeys. The Manx Shearwaters will go down to spend the summer off places like Brazil. Um, the Arctic Terns are probably the longest migrant that we have on Strangford Lock. These birds will come and breed on the islands 
and then in the winter they will then go down to the southern hemisphere and they will go as far as Antarctica and it's quite a small bird but um, they undertake this amazing journey and uh, it's been worked out that some of the really long-lived birds will probably undertake the same journey um, in their lifetime as uh, if you went to the, the moon and back so exceptional journeys and for such a small bird and be able to navigate uh, without any sort of GPS maps it is absolutely remarkable. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's, I talk about moths, sort of, they, they migrate quite a long distance as well as all the Lep, Leptora species would as well. Um, but nowhere near as far as some of these guys going from hemisphere to hemisphere. I mean, it's absolutely astounding sometimes. So we've got some other good questions here. Sheila says, uh, morning, Andrew, and what a tree player you are. For... <laughs> anyway, um, she's asking, can we plant more eelgrass and would that be an option? So my thought on that, of course, is like, well, why, why plant it when nature can do the work for us as long as we take care of obviously the things like the invasives? Yeah, I mean, certainly on strength with luck because of the designations, we don't tend to intervene uh, like that. But certainly the priority is more about making sure the habitat is right for the Zostera to flourish. And if you look after the habitat, the species will come with it. Yeah, so it's the same thing you hear me talk about for the likes of our woodlands. Um, you know, we get asked quite a lot, so why don't you put bird feeders out? Um, so basically, because we want to get the habitat right. So if we get the habitat right, the plant life, then come the small mammals and all the insects, you know, and, all, and so on, all, all with it. So it's the same principle out here on the lock, um, except minus the insect bit, although there are quite a lot of uh, food sources that obviously, you know, they live sub, sub below in the silts themselves and all those long build. Uh, birds like sort of kill you and the red shanks and, and, and plovers and things like that that you see probing the water all the time so so yeah and, and it's really chucking down now so we'll, we'll try and get a few a few more of these questions in before the the the, the electronics die um, we've got a couple more here so um leslie's asking him so what's the rarest bird that we spotted on the lock now i know that leslie uh was watching the uh great egret over at Castle Espy, um, I think it was yesterday or the day before, but there's been quite a few sort of unusual sightings to say the least over the years here. You know of any yourself, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, certainly with um, climate change, we are getting species that we wouldn't have seen here 20, 30 years ago. So probably the first were the things like the little egrets, the Mediterranean gulls, and they started arriving en masse about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we have several pairs of, of Mediterranean gulls that breed on the islands within Strangford Lock and uh, there's a small egret colony within a grey heronry uh, close to Strangford Lock as well. So um, those birds have started to become quite common now. And then we've started to get other species like great white egrets, spoonbills, both of which would have been mega rarities when I was growing up as a child. And now they are becoming more and more common and uh, it, it's believed it, it's an indicator of sort of climate change as we get uh, warmer winters. These birds are able to survive now and uh, it's quite remarkable how birds can adapt. So we tend to think of climate change sometimes being quite negative but they're also sort of positive so we get different species colonising. So that, that actually brings us quite nicely on. I've got a few other questions in the background, but I've just seen one pop up from, let's see, who is it from? And my screen has stopped working because it's so wet. Um, so I don't know who's asking it because I can just see the, the pop up, but um, was asking about what well, RQ curl you numbers depleting. Um, don't seem to see as many anymore. I'm, um, there's probably sort of two things going on here. Um, the wintering population generally is okay because our birds are coming from further north but the breeding population in Northern Ireland is of great concern. Uh, the numbers have absolutely have been decimated uh, for a number of reasons. And it is one of those conservation concerns that we have here. But in terms of Strangford Lock, we don't get breeding curlew, uh, but we get uh, huge numbers of birds wintering here. So yeah, so my, my understanding at the moment is, is primarily the issue of curlew is it's their, their breeding sites in upland areas that are basically sort of 
usually it's the classic story it's habitat loss in the in the, in the main and there's other land use challenges and issues which are having impacts as well and then with such low numbers they then fall foul of, of even just indiscriminate natural predators so it, it's kind of like a whole whammy of things that's that's having impacts there um what's the answer angie i'm going to put you on the spot here what what you know in an ideal world what what would be, would we be trying to do i think again it, it, it's about getting the habitat right um and uh, working with landowners, farmers, to introduce measures that can help uh, curlews. I mean, there's a really good project up in the glens of Antrim at Glen Werry, where they've taken proactive measures to improve the habitat for wading birds. And uh, they, as part of that, they've also uh, done predator control, uh, particularly around sort of foxes, corvids, which are uh, decimating some of those wading birds and uh, they've had some really good results as, as a result of that. So, so yeah I mean it's worth mentioning um, I'm gonna stand up because my knees are hurting <laughs> I sort of yeah. lean, lean against the side of the vehicle and okay. um, yeah so so when we're talking about predator control so these are in isolated cases now um, I'm not aware that we're doing any of that on any of our land um, but I know that some some other places are and again it's it's case by case basis that's based on immediate locale where you've got basically a population of say curlew hanging on by a thread and basically that's all that's remaining so COVID, uh, corvid um which are crow family and like the sort of fox as well they do need to be controlled basically to to retain the remaining um curly curlew breeding population for example but i say it's case by case it's not a blanket across the board um, i think that's that's probably worth mentioning now just on that note as well andrew mentioned that we we hold the is it all of or the majority of the shooting rights across um strangford lock itself and so why is that the the trust was the first organization to get involved in the protection of strangford lock in the 50s and 60s uh, and that was as a result of concerns about commercial wild fowling and uh, the, particularly the, the numbers of widgeon being decimated. Um, so it was quite a, a challenge at the time and um, the early staff who were involved in looking after Strangford Lock um, started making uh, friendships and relationships with the wild fowling clubs and uh, it was a challenge but over time they built up a really good partnership we work very closely with the four wild fowling clubs and the overall umbrella organization the british association and i appreciate that not everyone will agree with wild fowling but the guys who undertake it they they take out very few ducks and they actually do a lot of really good conservation work and um, they do various projects, uh, they lift litter, they do habitat management with us and uh, it's a really good partnership which demonstrates what you can do when you can get, you get two opposing groups coming together and seeing what, how they can develop a, a really good constructive partnership. Definitely, um, I think one of the, the sort of that stuck with me over the years is like when uh, I was told once you know conservation isn't actually about what we're conserving it's actually about people um, you know love it or hate it humans kind of have such a massive impact on everything that we do and we also have the power to kind of correct and, and, and address issues that some of them are of our own creating some of them are um, perhaps not it's we're sort of probably going into some wide semantics here um, but it's just you know it's a fantastic thing to think about and um, so my screen, just for a warning guys, my screen is doing all sorts of different things at the moment. It's starting to get wet. Um, Sheila was asking, um, are we doing the webs counts today? Now most of those have already been done, have they, Andrew? Yeah, we, we do webs counts on Strangford Lark, um, both the mid to high counts, which are also known as the core counts, and we also do low water counts. So um, the low water counts don't start till November. The core counts start in September, and those are usually done in the middle Sunday of every month, uh, right through to March. And we have a huge team of staff and volunteers who help with that work. Definitely, I think that, that goes for everything. I mean, you hear me talk about the, the, the value and the support that is absolutely fantastic from 
the likes of volunteers that help us out here and we could not do what we do. It's the same with all of the other organisations, RSPB, BTO, the Wildlife and Wetlands Trust, all the rest of them, that we could not do what we do without volunteers. So big shout out to them and thank you for your support as always. Um, I'm trying to get to some questions here because the screen is being a bit funny here, so we'll see how we go. David says we're digging deep, well done. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, oh yeah, so I picked up Heather's, it was Heather who asked about the Kelly's, there we go. Um, Les says, birds are amazing, they certainly are, I agree. And my screen is doing all sorts of weird things here. Um, da -da -da -da. So, Jane says we deserve a, hot, a, hot, a, cup, chop, uh, a cup of hot chocolate when we get back and we've been really enjoying the live stream, so thank you very much, Jane. So, I, I'm kind of thinking we may have to cut this slightly short today because it is coming down in its droves, but um, is there anything in particular you want to sort of have a have a sort of highlight here on the lock and what the Strangford team cover? Because um, I say I'm in my own little world here at Mount Stewart a lot of the time, but there's a whole big uh, uh, sort of spread of what we do outside here at East Down and on the Strangford lock itself. And it's not just the lock, it's also around the Ars Peninsula itself, um, Kearney, Orlock Point, you know, from one end to the other. Um, tell us a bit about the team's work up there. Yeah, um, we look after a huge area, so it's about 12,000 acres of coast and countryside, um, a huge proportion of Strangford Lock, um, over half of it is looked after by the National Trust, so a lot of the foreshore, um, probably about uh, 20, 30 islands we look after, and then as Toby says, uh, quite a lot of the Ards Peninsula, so as far south as Ballyquinton and Bar Hall, um, the lovely 18th century fishing village at Kearney, um, Glastry Clay Pits near Ballyhalbert, and moving further north, um, places on the North Down coast like Orlock Point, Bally McCormick Point, McCutcheon's Field. Uh, we look, also own one of the Copeland Islands, Lighthouse Island, and uh, we lease that to the Copeland Bird Observatory. We also own Killy Nether Wood near Scrabo, and we lease that to NIEA. So it's a huge area, very diverse range of work that the team does. It's quite a small team. We have five rangers on Strangford Lock um, and again we rely heavily on volunteers and uh, we couldn't do half the work that we get done without those volunteers who help us in all sorts of different ways. So the work, um, a lot of it is monitoring, so doing uh, the webs counts the breeding seabird counts. Uh, we count the seals each year, uh, both the harbour seals and um, grey seals. And then it's practical work, so again doing things like the Spartina, um, controlling other invasive scrub on our sites, uh, working with a whole range of different tenant farmers. Uh, about 25 sites uh, we let the grazing out under Conacre and those farmers graze or um, work with us in a different way to make sure that the farming is environmentally sensitive. Um, we look after about um, 12 car parks around the area and manage about 13 kilometres of footpaths so we provide lots of opportunities for people to appreciate this wonderful landscape. Uh, we have the When it's dry. <laughs> We have the uh, Bothy on Salt Island, so if you're into kayaking, um, although the Bothy at the moment is currently closed because of the COVID regulations, when we get that open again, it, you can kayak out there and you can book the Bothy through Mount Stewart. And it's the only option that you have on Strangford Lock to actually be able to stay out on one of the islands. So our work is very diverse. Um, we also look after the archaeology and in Grey Abbey Bay it's probably one of the best locations. Uh, we have a 5,000 year old log boat which is in the mud flats out here. We have um, 18th century kelp beds um, which would have been used for um, getting iodine from the seaweed. So you'll see lots of lines of boulders on the mud flats. And um, also there are also um, kelp bit, sorry not kelp bits, um, um, fish traps as well. Those are actually fish traps out yeah. there. Whereas 
where the medieval monks, um, they would have waited for the tide to come in, the fish would have come in, and then gradually as the tide ebbed, those fish would have then been trapped behind those lines of stone and uh, would have provided a great uh, feast for the monks who lived locally in places like Grey Abbey. Okay, right. So, like we are getting soaked here, so and, the, and I'm, amazingly nothing has broken yet on, on the electronics wise, but I, I can barely use the screen at the moment, so I can't see everybody's questions. There's bound to be a few questions that I haven't been able to pick up, and I'll, I'll pick them up at lunch with that hot chocolate that you guys are recommending that we have. Um, so yeah, sorry for having to cut this one short, but I think uh, the weather has actually beaten us here today. Um, but uh, there's a few, I can see a couple of questions there um, about otters and things like that. So yeah, the otters are doing really well on the lock, can't they? Yes, sir. Otters? Yeah, um, pretty much um, anywhere on Strangford Lock you'll be able to see otters. Um, places like Anne's Point opposite Mount Stewart is a wonderful site for them. And they come all the way up the Glenburn stream. So if anybody's watched some of the past um, little wildlife camera videos that we picked up from the estate, you'll see the otters obviously come up the stream too. They come to the lake as well. Um, right, this is just crazy now. So guys, um, I just want to say <laughs> thank you very much for watching from your lovely, warm, dry homes. Um, we enjoyed these as always. This is Andrew's first one, so fair play to him for <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming out in the rain like this. Um, our next live stream is on November the 17th, and we're back with Ollie, um, assistant head gardener, and we're going to take a stroll down from some of the working areas of the um, the property, so, so a bit of the behind the scenes elements for the gardens team, and then finish up around the uh, Lilywood and Topiary areas because they're just starting to do the end of year cuts for, for those around that time. So thank you very much everybody. We are going to go and get dry um, and do plop any more questions in um, and I'll jump on the, the feed there in a little bit and answer some of them. So thank you everybody and we'll see you in a month's time. Bye. Thank you.